Well, thank you very much. It is a, a, an awesome privilege for me to be with you. I, um, I count it uh, as if you and I are uh, on the same team. I, uh, I tell people, I know oftentimes I'm listed as a speaker. Uh, I'm not a speaker. Uh, I'm a teacher. Um, and, and you know, I've told this to many people, but I, we might as well get it out straight here, because if you've come to hear a great speaker, you're going to be really disappointed. You know, there's a big difference between speakers and teachers. Speakers have a very well-honed narrative. They practice it. They run through it. They have a start time and end time. And throughout that speech, they'll take us to the height of emotion and we'll laugh. And then they'll drop us to the bottom and we'll cry. And then they'll take us to a place where we don't know whether to laugh or to cry. And then just as the speech is about to end, it rises to this great crescendo. And we, and, and we rise to our feet in great ovation. Teachers aren't like that. <laughs> right? We just teach until the bell rings and then we quit. <laughs> See, I don't care about moving you emotionally. I don't care about moving you emotionally. And my guess is you don't care about moving your students emotionally either. What we care about is the deep transformation that God does in the life of our students. But more than just a teacher, I now see myself as a tour guide. That's all I am. Because it has nothing to do with me. People go, don't, don't go on a tour because of the tour guide. They go on a tour because of the jewels in the cave. And that's all I am. I feel like I'm just a tour guide pointing out the jewels in the cave. And the jewels in the cave are all about him. That is ultimately what we do. If we want to teach that which is ultimately the best, the ultimate the source of all truth, we point people to the very nature and the very character of God. So what, uh, what I thought we might do today is to sit back and take a look at a few things that I think are very, very important for us to understand about what is happening in the culture around us. I want to talk about the issue of relativism and what is happening to it. I love college students, by the way. I love college students. I love hanging with college students. I'd rather be with them than anybody else. That's no offense to you guys. It means you have to stay up early in the morning sometimes. It means you have to learn how to eat pizza. A lot of it. But I love being with college students. But let me tell you, they're in trouble. And they're in trouble because we send them off to the most hostile ground in this country. The most hostile ground to a biblical and Christian worldview is the university campus. And you all are preparing our kids to go there. You're preparing them to go to that battleground. And it's not just that battleground. It's the battleground of the culture around us. You know that as well as I do. And I spent a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with the students because the, the, the program I'm involved with with, uh, in, with undergraduate students is, a, is an immersion program. It's not just a standard college deal where they show up or don't show up. We'd go hiking together. We'd play ultimate frisbee together. I have one-on-ones with them, and I can tell you that's why there's a big box of Kleenex in my office. And the reason is because I can't tell you how many times I have had a weeping session with a young Christian girl or a young Christian guy because of what happened in the battleground. And, and one of the things that I see over and over again is that we have been so infiltrated by the world that we often don't recognize it. I spent 20 years in the, in the Air Force a lot of that time is spent training on what does it mean to be a warrior. And one of the things that is important is you have to understand the enemy. 
If you don't understand, understanding the times, remember, as, as you're probably familiar with, the description of the sons of Issachar, those people who were uh, mighty men of David, who came along David. Remember this amazing thing. David was anointed as king, but he wasn't accepted as king. And the mighty men wanted to change that. Well, the sons of Issachar were, were pointed out because they understood the times in which they lived. And they knew what Israel should do. The, the Hebrew word there is banah. And it's more than just knowing clinically. It was, a, it was a deep wisdom and understanding, a discernment that, that was able to understand the times in which they live. And we need to understand the times in which we live. And that won't come without, for my, and I'm prejudiced here, you can't understand the times in which we live without a biblical worldview. You cannot do that. So I want to point to a few, and, and I, these are just some little things that we talk about before we get on the bus and go on the tour. I also want to, I am going to say some things that are going to be, first of all, will sound critical. And I, I am working, my personal my personal walk. I'm working on not being a critical person. Because one of the characteristics that I begin to see over and over in my life and in, in, in evangelical Christian in general is that we are no longer a people of hope. In Second Peter it says that you and I are to honor Christ as holy. How? by always being prepared to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you. I've been asking evangelical Christians for a long time, said, when was the last time somebody asked you for the reason, for the hope that is in you? And you know what they say? Never. There, there are a couple of reasons for that. We won't we'll deal with one of them. We don't build relationships with people. That's what's one of the things that's happening in our culture, that we're destroying relationships. But number two, we have become less and less a people of hope. You know, really, we, oftentimes we act like doom and gloom and agony on me. And so I'm going to say some things that are going to, they will sound critical, but I'm saying those uh, primarily from the standpoint, I, I don't know if I had it here, but... Um, this is, not a, this is not a point of finger at a current president because back when I was in the White House, I remember reading a State of the Union by the president who is in, in office at that time. And I, I wept in my soul. And the reason was because I said, this isn't the state of our union. Do you know what I mean by that? It is time for us to stop talking in political power terms. It's time to stop and say, folks, this is the state. This is the state of our union. Because if we don't recognize the state we're in, then we'll never be able to change. We'll never be able to go in the direction that God is calling us to go. So I will say some things that will sound critical, but I'm, I, I want them to be received, and I, I want to say them in, in a way of simply looking at reality, okay? We live, the, we live in a culture, if you don't recognize it, don't understand it, we live in a culture of public atheism. Public atheism. You and I are allowed to have your own private beliefs. You, you, can, you can be a theist privately, but from a public standpoint, we have rejected God. You cannot bring into the public square your biblical worldview to argue from that. We have to recognize that. We're going to have to accept the fact. We have changed so drastically in this culture that we have rejected God publicly in the public square. We are an atheistic country. I hate to even say that. I hate the sound of it. But you and I know, you cannot argue from a biblical worldview in the public square anymore. First of all, you're, you won't be given the time to do that, right? 
And I counsel my college students all the time. You know, they want to say, oh, we can go on this show and so forth. I said, you know, you know, think through that. Because it used to be years and years ago, even though we've never been a perfect nation, we have never been. We've had some horrible sins in the past in this life. But there was a general consensus of a biblical worldview. And there was a day when a, when a soundbite would cause people to go to their knees. Why? Because a, a reference to a scripture or appointing a brother and sister to the Lord in some way would convict us and we would drop to our knees. My friends, we don't have that anymore. The, in a soundbite world, it doesn't work. You're not given the time to go back and build. You know what I'm talking about? To build the case to build the foundation in your argument. It will only be taken as a pearl and trampled under feet. Now, that's, that's not to say that we, we then uh, walk away from the public square. I'll be the first to say we can't abandon the public square, but we must go with wisdom. We must be wise as serpent, if we understand that phrase correctly, not to be a serpent. We need to be wise. In how we proceed in the state of our culture. We need to understand the times. We need to banah. There is a deep relativism. It's like a it's like a disease. It's the it's the silent killer that has crept into our nation. I want, to, I want to speak about this. I want to teach about this. I want to take us on a tour about this, and we'll probably do it mainly this afternoon because this morning we have something more important that we need to do with, with ourselves to lay a, a foundation. It's, it's a part of our biblical worldview, but it's a foundation that's necessary before we can even deal with these things. And that is what we're going to do. And the first thing we need to do then is to talk about the loss of the meta narrative that has occurred in our culture. And it not only has occurred, uh, occurred in, the, in the public realm, you know what I mean by that? It, there, is a, there is a public realm and there's a private realm in our culture. That's what we're talking about before. You you can claim to know God in the private realm, and you're allowed to do that. You know, we still live in a nation that is relatively free. You can can have your personal beliefs, but you cannot take that to the public level. And so when we talk about the loss of meta-narrative, we're talking about the loss of the meta-narrative at the public realm, but it also is the symptom of the loss of the meta narrative in the private realm. Just as we can say that the public deep relativism that we see is a symptom of a relativism that is creeping into our own life and into the life of our students. My, uh, my family has a, a tradition it's been going on for a number of years. <clears throat> for Christmas, uh, mainly I uh, get a jigsaw puzzle. And we've been doing that for years and years. And over the Christmas holidays, we would put it together. And then after a while, my wife decided that I was putting together the puzzle too quickly. <laughs> so one year, my wife gave the present of the jigsaw puzzle without the picture. Just the bag of puzzle pieces. She thought that was clever. Now, it wasn't really mean. It was just upping the challenge a little bit. But what if my wife had given the bag of puzzle pieces to me and she'd thrown in some other pieces from another puzzle. Ooh. 
That would be me. A jigsaw puzzle is really an awesome way to think about and to teach about worldview. Let's suppose that the jigsaw puzzle picture is a worldview. That's what a, that's what a worldview is. And the pieces are really the individual truth claims that make up that worldview. And what I would submit to you, and I, I would imagine you all would accept, is that the biblical Christian worldview is the picture, is the worldview that matches reality. It matches what is really real. And that is why we would say, although the public would not accept this, we would say that if you do not have a biblical Christian worldview, then the odds are you may miss what's really going on. You may have an inability, for example, it's one of the deep uh, problems we have in our culture. I see it in our kids all the time. And it's a result of relativism, but when you reject the notion of absolute truth and a meta-narrative of the large story, you have a tendency to be able to not connect the dots between actions and causes. I have a lot of people today will find themselves in some situation and they can't figure out why this happened. It just happened, right? Because they can't connect the effect with their own cause, their own actions. Does it, does it make sense? I know you understand this. So, if you look at a piece of the jigsaw puzzle, could you tell me what that picture is? Of course not. I mean, you can't, you can't tell what the picture is with just one piece of the puzzle. But if you were to look at all of the worldviews that we have today, I mean, they make nice pictures, but the problem is, is that we live in a culture where we are bombarded by so many different pictures that you and I begin to carry a whole bunch of different pieces. And the pieces don't really fit together. They can't fit together. And, you, and we end up living in a confused way because we can't make sense of anything. Later on this afternoon, I, I want to go through a little graphic work with you to try to talk uh, about how this uh, happens and to try to look a little bit inside ourselves, the, in, the human being, to recognize we're going to talk about the heart and what is the heart from a biblical perspective and try to draw the, uh, the conclusions and, 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 and uh, connect the dots, so to speak, to these things that we are, we're, we're talking about. Well, the source of all truth, the source that brings us to the point where we can recognize that of all the worldviews that are bombarding us in our culture today, there is a true worldview. Now, in a relativist, in a public world, in, 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 a, in a public setting in our culture, to say there is only one worldview is to be what? What kind of words would be? Pardon me? Closed-minded? Bigot? A bigot? All of these things that would be late. Why? Because publicly we have rejected the meta narrative and the God of the meta narrative. So that's why you can't speak of those things. But here we will say that one of those is a picture of true reality. And that is the biblical Christian worldview. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, to say that statement, what I just said, even with some very high select Christian college students, it irks them. Maybe it even irks 
you. And if it does, that's good for you to recognize because we have been touched by this deep relativism. And to say that there is only one worldview that perfectly matches reality in the world in which we live sounds arrogant, sounds bigoted. Does it not? Of course, because we live in a culture that is radically, radically changed. So we recognize that the source of truth, remember when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. If Jesus is the truth, then that tells us worlds about what truth is. It is divine. It is not relative. Jesus isn't just here to here and there and over here and uh, well I think Je you know Jesus didn't say I think I'm the way. He said I am the way. He didn't say I think I'm the truth. He said I am the truth. Jesus wouldn't fly in the public realm today. The very nature and the very character of God is the source of all truth. And that is why we mentioned earlier, that's why we must continually go back to him. We must go back to his nature, back to his character. You know, and that is why we'll do this just briefly. One of the things that we've lost in our culture today is the, is, is, is the understanding that if God is who he says he is, if what we understand from not only just the special revelation that God has given to us, but we understand it from the general revelation around us, that the, the creator God is not a monolithic God. He's not a monolithic God. He is a socially complex God. And we know that he, within the very nature, within the Godhead of the one true God, is the socially complex God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Forgive me for abbreviating. And he exists in this perfect Harmony, perfect relationship, the perfect social order which has existed for all eternity. And if we understand that of the creator God, of the very nature of God, then now all of a sudden it makes sense to look at the reality of the world around us that we would find a universe filled with diversity and unity. The unity of diverse pieces and parts is the fundamental description and essence of our universe. Our universe is not filled with a bunch of random pieces and parts. It is not. Our universe is filled with the most exquisite systems, and those systems consist of extremely diverse pieces brought together in a unity for a higher purpose. That is why when we look not just at the material world around us, but we also then look at the social realm and we look at the family, for example. Boy, is this under attack. And from a biblical Christian worldview, what do we find? We find two very diverse, the two most diverse aspects of human beings are male and female. I don't care what the world will tell you that says that men and women are the same. Those are people who have never been married. <laughs> the male and the female are the most diverse parts of the human race. You can factor in you can factor in race, you can factor in language, you can factor in geographical areas of the world, you can, you can factor anything you want, and nothing is as diverse as the male and female. 
universally understood. And God brought together those two diverse pieces, the husband and the wife, and he brought them together that they might produce children. And we're going to talk about this in just a second. But this is only to, only to bring forth the fact that it is the nature of God that helps us understand the universe and helps us understand social order. If you reject God, if you reject the meta narrative, then we make social order whatever we want. This is not intended to be a defense of marriage or the defense of the family. It's not intended to do that. It's, in, it's intended for us to recognize and understand that if we hold a biblical worldview, to recognize that the source of the truth for our biblical worldview is Him. It is his nature, it is his character. And that is why you and I, and hopefully we will provoke this in our students, that your ultimate objective in life, my ultimate objective in life, our students hopefully, the, the ultimate objective of their life is to know him. To draw near to him. That is our daily quest to hunger for The child of God hungers for him. To know who he is. Because that is the source of all truth. And that is why we need to take a tour and gaze upon the face of God. And we're going to do that this morning, and the bell will ring, and we'll just, we're, there's no great crescendo here, okay? The bell's going to ring at 920, and we're going to take a break. I was privileged to take a tour myself down the Grand Canyon, into the Grand Canyon. Seven days, seven nights, on two baby blue World War II rubber rafts. Over 150 miles, 150 rapids. It was an awesome trip. If you've been to the Grand Canyon, you haven't been in the Grand Canyon. I don't mean to be critical there, but it is an awesome experience. And when I say in the Grand Canyon, there were times where we were really in this is one of the rapids. We had two, uh, two uh, rafts. Um, we took a, I took a film crew down on the second one, and uh, we took some shots of the sister raft after we'd gone through. We'd pull over and sp spend the nights on the sandbars. This is the Little Colorado River. That is the, pic that is the color of the Little Colorado River. This is moi. We'd climb up, uh, take side trips up side canyons. Uh, we were there primarily to look at the geology. I'm hoping, this is not an advertisement, but I'm hoping to create a little series called Listening to the Canyon uh, to talk about the difference between the standard geological story and the reality of what we see in the canyon because what we see in the canyon doesn't match the standard geological story which trips many of our students up in college. And it was an awesome trip. In fact, I need to tell you that after the first day, our tour guide pointed to me and he said, Tackett, you cannot use the word awesome again for the rest of this trip. <laughs> and the reason was because on every bend, I'd say, awesome. And we'd climb, we'd go up these little side, I'd say, this is awesome. And he said, you can't use that word anymore. <laughs> and so I think I had to start using something like, amazing, this is amazing. And, and by the middle of day two, he says, you can't use the word amazing anymore. And then it was unbelievable. Unbelievable, unbelievable. You can't use unbelievable because it was unbelievable. I think by, you know, we saw creatures that thought we were the spectacle, not them. St. Nemo's chasm. We, we climbed up a cave in the back there and jumped off the top down to a deep pool. It was, it was stupendous. It was stupendous. <laughs> By the end of the trip, I think I was reduced to something like 
Blimey. Blimey. <laughs> this is the film crew. This was at the Havasu Creek. I said, I said, stop. Let me get a picture. You're glowing. And so it's our personalities. It's not. It's, it's, this, it's this Havasu Creek. Everything and everywhere was blimey. What was interesting is they issued a waiver for us before we started. If any of you have been skiing, uh, you may not know it, but you sign a waiver. We had this waiver. It was very interesting. It was two pages long, single-spaced. And it said, said you, can, you can get killed. You can get dismembered. You can lose a finger. You can lose a toe. You can lose your eyes. You can get burned. You can go mad. You can go insane. You can get lost. You can get bitten by a snake. You can get trampled by a, by a who knows what, and over and over and over. And then the last paragraph said, and any other thing which can dismember, kill, make insane, whatever, you hold us, un, uh, irre, you know, yeah, that. <laughs> and, then the, and then it said, have a great trip, your river crew. <laughs> and they said, sign here. I said, I didn't sign here. Said, Look at all this stuff. He said, oh, don't worry about it. He said, why'd you put all this? Oh, you'll have a great time. And to some extent, you and I need to recognize and understand that there is a waiver associated with coming into the presence of God. When you and I come into the presence of God, it's not safe. Remember, was it... Uh, I don't know if I, if I have it here or not. Yeah, in... Uh, in the Chronicles of Narnia, remember the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? And uh, Mr. Beaver said, as long as a lion, the great lion. And remember, ooh, said Susan, is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And Mr. Beaver said, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And one of the things that happens when we come into the presence of God is that we want to run away. I don't usually like to go and speak places. I just had a, an awesome time uh, with the, the Coast Guard Academy. I spent four days with them. And the reason I'm kind of uncomfortable even here is because it's my practice to get a list of the people. I had a list of all the cadets who were Coast Guard cadets who were cadets are going to be on the retreat. And I'm on my knees before God for them. Because I know that there is nothing I can say or do other than what the Lord may want to do through me, but it's the, it is God who needs to change them. I've learned a long time ago, my friends, that if I don't pray for my students, nothing really happens. And I enjoin you to do the same because if we are bringing them into the presence of God, if we're pointing them to the character and nature of God, I guarantee you they will want to run away at some point. You and I will want to run away. Even you may be recognizing and understanding there are certain aspects of God's nature that we'd rather not go visit. This happens all the time with my students when we're talking about a certain aspect of God's nature. And they, and they, they will say, I, I, just, I, I just, I don't want to go there. It's because we have a tendency to, to run away from him. This was my second tour down the Grand Canyon, but the ultimate tour, and it was an amazing tour. It was a blimey tour. But the amazing tour is the tour that you and I have the privilege to take any time we want to. You and I have the privilege to gaze upon the face of God. Our students have that privilege. Isn't that amazing that God has allowed us to do this? Do you ponder that? Do you ponder the reality that you can any time you want to walk into the throne room of God and gaze upon his face. When we do, it is sometimes troubling 
This is the objective of our life, is to know him. That's where we find the ultimate source of all truth. I've, I've been fascinated with these encounters that finite man has with God, those that are recorded for us in the scriptures, because when we come into the presence of God and, and man comes into the presence of God, all of a sudden his nature is exposed for us. It is revealed for us. And those of you who've been through the Truth Project, you'll know that one of my favorites is the, is the, is the, is the encounter that Isaiah had. And there was a waiver that should have been given to Isaiah before. Remember? And, and of course, you know, Jacob encountered God. Remember, he, he went away uh, limping, but he had a new name. He rewards those who seek him. So let me, let me go through this encounter because there's something in this encounter that for those of you who've been to the truth that we skipped over and it's very, very important. I want to draw your attention to it. Why? Because there's an aspect of God's nature that I, and I don't want to overstate this. It'll sound like I'm overstating it. But there's an aspect of God's nature that I am convinced is the crown jewel in the attributes of God. And I know we should say that with some fear and trembling because it, it implies you can somehow rank order the character of God. And, and I, I know you can't do that, but this, I am, this is like the crown jewel. That's what we're, we're just going to peer at. We're not going to go the whole way. We can't. We, we just don't have the time to do that. But I want to introduce you to it just, just a, as a glimpse. And that's what we're going to look at this, this morning. And it's found here in this en encounter, but we skipped over it. And I want to go back. This is what Isaiah recorded about that encounter. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were the seraphs, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple filled with smoke. Woe is me, I cried, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The first thing that happens when we come into the presence of God is that it exposes us. That's why we'd rather run away. We live in a culture that teaches us how to wear a mask, to put on a mask for all kinds of reasons. You cannot wear a mask in the presence of God. You come into the presence of God in the presence of pure truth and all of a sudden, what was me? Did you notice God didn't have to say anything? You may have already experienced this. You know what is so wonderful about God? The mercy of God. The kindness of God is that when you come into his presence, he doesn't expose everything. If he did, we'd be crispy critters, would we not? But he exposes that which he desires to refine. Woe is me, I'm undone. That's, it's bad. We don't want to be exposed. But it's the second thing that even troubles us more because it exposes our culture. And I live among a people of unclean lips. We live in a culture that, that has honed to, a, to a, an amazing degree how to put on masks. We have Hollywood stars and starlets. And a whole industry is that honed to a fine tune how to Photoshop and how to and makeup and all that stuff. I'm not against makeup, ladies. I rather enjoy it. Not on myself, of course, but on, <laughs> on you. But you know what I'm talking about. And of course, we know now, not that I, not that I uh, 
endorse the paparazzi and all those kind of things. But you and I know behind the Photoshop is a life of misery and pain and loneliness and all kinds of troubles and problems that oftentimes end their life way too early. A woman who probably had the greatest voice that has ever been gifted by God to any woman in the world, Whitney Houston, gone. Everything looked great in the pictures. Our culture, my friends, our culture is dying behind the closed doors. It is weeping. It is moaning. It is groaning. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to see it. And then the third thing is it calls us to action. Three minutes before the bell rings. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal, which he'd taken from the tong, from the altar with tongs. With it, he touched my mouth. And he said, see, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. And then I heard the Lord say, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? It calls us to action. But there's something strange about Isaiah's encounter. I'm going to put it up here, and then we're going to take our break, and you can think about it. What's strange about the words of God? Let me give you a hint. It's found in these words. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? What is strange about this? And the reason we ask these questions, my friends, is because as the child of God, we want to know. Why does he say what he says? Who is this God? Remember William Wilberforce? William Wilberforce was changed by God. He had an encounter with God. And all of a sudden, he began to hear the clinking of the chains on the slaves. He began to smell the stench of the slave ships. Was the clinking there before? Yes. Was the stench there before? Yes. He couldn't smell it. He couldn't hear it. But something had happened to him. Why? Because he encountered the living God. And he was now changed as a result of that. He was exposed before God. And all of a sudden, his culture was exposed. And it called him to act. It called him to go. So we're going to take our break. And you can ponder, what is strange about these words of God? What should provoke in us a question that would cause us to pursue him?